Hello friends, I am Dr. Abhishek Naudari and I am back with my new video with clinical snippets from medicine, specially emphasizing the topics of neuroanatomy with medicine. Friends, neuroanatomy has always been my weaker subject all throughout my preparation. So, you need not read neuroanatomy separately. It will be a hectic job for you. So, you can integrate the clinical points from neuroanatomy with medicine and it makes me easier to explain and it makes you easier to cover the vast syllabus of neuroanatomy. Because neuroanatomy, even two or three questions are compulsory in any entrance examination. So, you must be thorough with the concepts of neuroanatomy. And with approaching next and AIMS examination, direct questions are least asked from these topics. There will be always integrated topics from neuroanatomy and medicine. So, without any delay, let's get started. A 68-year-old man is evaluated for visual loss in the left eye that resolves spontaneously within 7 hours. The patient has a history of hypertension, type 2 diabetes mellitus, coronary artery disease and ischemic cardiomyopathy. He has smoked a pack of cigarettes for the past 40 years. Physical examination reveals a left carotid bruit but no neurological deficits. A carotid duplex ultrasound shows 85% stenosis of the left internal carotid artery and carotid angiography with stenting is performed. Again my dear friends, it is a long question so you need to identify the keywords from the question. 68 year old man was evaluated for visual loss, loss of vision within 7 hours, sudden painless loss of vision. The first and the most important thing that should strike your mind is vascular cause. So sudden painless loss of vision you should suspect vascular cause first. The patient has all the comorbidities, hypertension, type 2 diabetes mellitus, coronary artery disease and ischemic cardiomyopathy. He has smoked a pack of cigarettes for the past 40 years, 40 pack years. Friends, personal history is very important in any case of medicine. 20 pack years is what it is, pro is what makes us prone for lung carcinoma. So history is always important in any case of medicine. Physical examination reveals a left carotid bruit. So, a left carotid bruit indicates atherosclerosis of the carotid artery. Obviously, in carotid duplex ultrasound, there is 85% stenosis. What is the most common systemic artery involved by atherosclerosis? Yes, my dear friend, the answer is carotid artery. But overall, the most common artery involved in the body by atherosclerosis is no, it is not carotid artery, but it is the coronary artery which is most commonly involved by atherosclerosis. So, coronary artery involved by atherosclerosis, they will be prone to decrease the blood supply to the heart, thereby producing angina and myocardial infarction. So, angina and myocardial infarction are very common and it is due to the atherosclerosis of the coronary arteries. Again, smoking is a direct risk factor for atherosclerosis and is known to be a causative agent in prime or a prime factor causing atherosclerosis. Type 2 diabetes mellitus is also indirectly related to atherosclerosis. So, a carotid angiography with stunting is done to relieve the obstruction of the carotid artery. Again, I would like to emphasize that sudden painless loss of vision, the first thing you should suspect is vascular cause. Not only vision, sudden painless loss of hearing or sudden painless sensory neuro neural hearing loss. Then also you should suspect any vascular cause. These are the vascular pathologies which are always sudden in onset and are always painless. One more question. What is the gradual painless loss of vision? Yes, my dear friends, it is cataract. Cataract is the cause of gradual painless loss of vision. So, it is the most common outside the country as well as in India. In children, Gradual painless loss of vision is caused due to? Yes, it is due to refractive errors. So, in this way friends, we must integrate medicine and ophthalmology. Whenever you read a topic, you must read it from all your sources, all the 19 subjects. Then, all the 19 subjects will be at your fingertips and you can revise at the end of the syllabus quite easily. So, this is what all integration is about. You hear one thing, sudden painless loss of vision, you open your ophthalmology textbook or notes and read the causes of gradual painful loss of vision 
sudden painful loss of vision the most common cause being acute congestive glaucoma or trauma trauma and congestive glaucoma both are causes of sudden painful loss of vision so let's see what are the other causes of sudden painless loss of vision they are central retinal central retinal artery occlusion in my video of cardiomyopathies i have discussed this topic that central retinal artery occlusion causes cherry red spot in the retina one more disease causing cherry red spot in the retina is commotia retina that is blunt trauma to the eye causes cherry red spot to the retina all this have been discussed in my video of cardiomyopathies you can read you can review it later but i have to make sure that there is no cherry red spot in gaucher's disease and fabry disease this is also a potential favorite mcq so sudden painless loss of vision most common cause is central retinal artery occlusion followed by central serous retinopathy and massive vitreous hemorrhage can also cause sudden painless loss of vision so all these are causes of sudden painless loss of vision massive vitreous hemorrhage involving the macular area only causes sudden painless loss of vision in the same way retinal detachment involving the macular area only causes sudden painless loss of vision optic neuritis is also a cause but the most important cause in toxicology which causes sudden painless loss of vision can any one of you guess my dear friends yes it is due to methyl alcohol amblyopia it is very important clinically as well because methyl alcohol is usually used as a substitute as a adulterant in ethyl alcohol and methyl alcohol amblyopia is a cause of sudden painless loss of vision during the procedure atherosclerotic debris embolize to the artery shown on the cerebral magnetic resonance angiogram below so you need to identify which is the artery involved in the cerebral magnetic angiogram image below so let's see what it is during the procedure atherosclerotic debris embolize to the artery shown on the cerebral magnetic resonance angiogram below identify the artery yes you must be aware of the circle of willis of the brain it's a must question for any entrance examination the most important artery contributing to the circle of willis is the tortuous artery given below as drawn by me this is the internal carotid artery which is the chief artery participating in the formation of circle of willis it gives off its first branch which is the anterior cerebral artery on both the sides so it is the anterior cerebral artery or the aca which is the first branch of the internal carotid artery and this is also the continuation of the anterior cerebral artery so these two arteries are again interconnected by the anterior communicating artery so this is the anterior cerebral artery given off from the internal carotid artery again one more branch given by the internal carotid artery is the middle cerebral artery this is the terminal branch of the internal carotid artery and it is the largest branch of the internal carotid artery but my dear friends middle cerebral artery doesn't contribute in the formation of circle of willis this is also a potential mcq again you can see these two are the vertebral arteries which unite together to form the basilar artery the basilar artery gives rise to the posterior cerebral artery this posterior cerebral artery is again in interconnected to the internal carotid artery with the posterior communicating artery so this is the vertebral arteries unite together to form the basilar artery giving rise to the posterior cerebral arteries and posterior cerebral arteries again communicating with the internal carotid arteries by the posterior communicating artery so this was a previous neat question which of the following is not a branch of internal carotid artery option a anterior cerebral artery option b middle cerebral artery option c posterior communicating artery option d posterior cerebral artery what is the answer yes it is a posterior cerebral artery which is not a branch of the internal carotid artery but it is a branch of the basilar artery so it is the anterior cerebral artery as identified by the image of the mr angiogram which of the following actions is most likely impaired in this patient so as you have realized my dear friends not only realizing that it is a vascular cause of loss of vision is not sufficient to get your mark in this question 
not only realizing that it is the anterior cerebral artery which is involved will fetch you mark. You must know what happens if the anterior cerebral artery is infarcted or ischemic or any emboli which travels to the anterior cerebral artery. Which of the following actions is most likely impaired in this patient? Option A. Climbing stairs. Option B. Gripping. Option C. Speaking. Option D. Swallowing food. And Option E. Whistling. Again friends, you must be aware of the fact that anterior cerebral artery supplies which part of the brain? It supplies the medial surface of the brain. And by looking at the options, you can easily rule out three options. Friends, you must be aware and conscious in your examination hall. Common sense will fetch you more marks than the medical knowledge itself. Let's see how we can apply our common sense in this question. See, speaking, swallowing food and whistling are all related to muscles of mouth or throat. So all these cannot be affected in, will be affected in the artery of one artery, in the region of one artery. So this cannot be the answer. So we'll eliminate swallowing, speaking and food. We'll eliminate these three options. That is swallow, speaking, swallowing and whistling. And again, we'll, we are stuck between two options. You must attempt this question because you have 50% chance of getting the right answer. So if you don't know the exact answer of a question, you need to eliminate the options. Then you'll be more closer to the answer. So as these three are related and are related to muscles of mouth, these three are eliminated. So our choice is to choose between climbing stairs and gripping. So climbing stairs is related to lower limb and gripping is related to upper limb. So climbing stairs is the one which is the answer my dear friends. Because it is the anterior cerebral artery in fact which affects the lower limb more commonly than the upper limb. So climbing stairs is the first one which is to be affected. So, once again, looking at the MR angiogram, identify the vessels, friends. What is this shown? This is the anterior cerebral artery, which is the first branch from the internal carotid artery. And these two unite together to form the, are united by the anterior communicating artery. So, this forms the anterior part of the circle of Willis. What is the artery marked in green? This is the artery, which is marked in green, which is the terminal branch of the internal carotid artery. It is the middle cerebral artery. It is a tortuous branch and the terminal branch, but it does not contribute to the formation of circle of villus. Again, artery marked in blue. It is the tortuous branch and it is the most important artery. It is the artery contributing to the circle of villus. It is none other than the internal carotid artery or the ICA. It is the main branch forming the circle of villus. So, I hope you are clear. Again, this is the anatomy made seen in your book, but such images are rarely asked in the exam. Only clinical pathological correlation, that is MRI or CT images, are shown in the image. In the recent need as well, two images of CT and MRI were put up and the part of the brain were to be identified. So friends, you need to be aware of the anatomy of the brain in the CT or the MRI. Just by studying the anatomy images given in the book is not so, is not so scoring. It's very easy to study the circle of villus in this, but here it is difficult to identify. So first read this and then go back and read the MRI and the CT findings as well. One more thing is to, is to identify the cadaveric images. That's also a trending topic now. We need to identify the vessels and the nerves on the cadaveric images. So let's see this circle of villus as well. We saw these are the vertebral arteries un unite together to form the basilar artery. We see small small branches arising from the basilar artery. All these are nothing but the pontine branches. So, the small small branches arising from the vertebral arteries are the pontine branches. And this is the posterior cerebral artery arising from the vertebral artery and communicating with the internal carotid artery by the posterior communicating artery. Mind you friends, the vertebral artery before joining together to form the basilar artery gives off a terminal branch which is known as posterior inferior cerebellar artery. Posterior inferior cerebellar artery is also known by the name of pica. What is the importance of pica? In my previous video itself, I have given the importance of pica. Pica is the artery involved in the lateral medullary syndrome or the Wallenberg syndrome. So, what happens in lateral medullary syndrome or Wallenberg syndrome? There is contralateral loss of pain and temperature all throughout the body. 
with ipsilateral Horner syndrome and ipsilateral loss of pain and temperature on the face. Mind you friends, there is no hemiplegia in lateral medullary syndrome or Wallenberg syndrome. Whereas in medial medullary syndrome, there is ipsilateral paralysis of the 12th nerve or the hypoglossal nerve or a pure motor nerve. Like I said, the motor nuclei are always medial. So it is the hypoglossal nerve which is pure motor. So it is medial and it is involved in medial medullary syndrome. So this is the trick to remember the difference between lateral medullary syndrome and medial medullary syndrome. Ipsilateral 12th nerve palsy with continental hemiplegia is medial medullary syndrome. Again, the internal carotid artery is shown here. It is the largest branch of the circle of Willis and it gives off the anterior cerebral artery which together are connected together by the anterior communicating artery. So, we see that the circle of Willis is located in the area of the brain. What is this area of the brain known as? Where the circle of villus is located. What is this area of the brain where the circle of villus is located? Yes, my dear friends, it is the interpeduncular fossa. So the circle of villus is located in the interpeduncular fossa of the brain. Again, to emphasize, it is the internal carotid artery which is contributing maximum to the circle of villus. So, you need to open your anatomy book and read about the interpeduncular fossa. It is a rhomboid space and is bounded by the crust cerebri of the cerebral peduncles on one side and anteriorly by the optic chiasma and optic tract and posteriorly by the pons. Interpeduncular fossa is very important question in anatomy. This is how we relate our medicine and anatomy. You read about circle of villus, you take out your anatomy book and read about interpeduncular fossa. Interpeduncular fossa is a rhomboid space bounded by the crust cerebri of the cerebral peduncle. Anteriorly, it is bounded by optic chiasma and optic tract, and posteriorly, it is bounded by the pons. The contents of the interpeduncular fossa. You need to remember them in the order. They constitute the infundibulum of the pituitary and the tuber cinerium. Infundibulum of the pituitary is nothing but the stalk of the pituitary on the hypophysis cerebri. And then, the rounded elevations in the middle of the interpeduncular fossa are the mammillary body. And the posterior perforated substance is also a part of the interpeduncular fossa. Don't get baffled by seeing the word posterior perforated substance. It is nothing but the arteries, the, the arteries which are supplying the brain, which are branches of the posterior cerebral artery. So the posterior cerebral artery supplies the brain through the posterior perforated substance. So these arteries enter the brain through this posterior perforated substance. Again, Ames November 2018 question. Which of the following is not a part of interpeduncular fossa? You must be aware that the anterior perforated substance is not a part of interpeduncular fossa. So, this is a beautiful image depicting the interpeduncular fossa. You can see that it is formed by the crust cerebri on either side and anteriorly by the optic tract and posteriorly by the pons. So, anteriorly by the optic tract and optic chiasma, posteriorly by the pons and on either side by the crust cerebri. So, this is what constitutes the boundaries of the interpeduncular fossa. Seeing the contents, we already saw it is the tuber cinerium, which is the elevation produced by the nuclei beneath and the infundibulum or the stalk of the hypophysis cerebri and two rounded elevations known as the mammillary body. The most important one is the posterior perforated substance, which are the arteries supplying the brain, which are the branches of the posterior cerebral artery. So, mind you friends, this is also an important question. The anterior perforated substance is not a part or a constituent of the interpeduncular fossa. Again to emphasize, the anterior perforated substance is not a content of the interpeduncular fossa. So, let's quickly identify these arteries. This is the anterior cerebral artery. The one in green is the middle cerebral artery and the one in blue is the internal carotid artery. This cerebral magnetic resonance angiogram shows the 3D reconstruction of the circle of villus. The internal carotid arteries are the large vessels seen bilaterally in the center. Each internal carotid artery gives off a middle cerebral artery to supply the lateral part of the brain. Again friends, the lateral part of the brain is supplied by the middle cerebral artery and the anterior cerebral artery supplies the medial part of the brain. So, laterally is supplied by the middle cerebral artery and constituting by the motor homunculus laterally the upper limb and the face are represented laterally 
whereas the lower limb is represented medially. So in an anterior cerebral artery infarct, as we saw in our question, the lower limbs are affected more commonly than the upper limbs and the face. Each anterior cerebral artery supplies the medial region of the ipsilateral cerebral hemisphere from the frontal bone to the pareto occipital sulcus. So let's see this is an important exam image based question for the exam. This is the lateral view of the, of the brain and this is the medial view of the brain. How to identify this corpus callosum, splenium and the cingulate gyrus above the corpus callosum. These are to be identified on present and the medial part of the brain. So medial surface of the brain is easily identified by this corpus callosum and splenium and the lateral ventricle. This is the lateral surface of the brain where the lateral ventricle and the corpus callosum are absent. So we can see that in the lateral surface of the brain, it is maximum constituted by the middle cerebral artery. This yellow area is represented by the middle cerebral artery, whereas the blue area is represented by the anterior cerebral artery. So the anterior cerebral artery constitutes a maximum supply on the medial surface of the brain, whereas the middle cerebral artery supplies the maximum part of the lateral surface of the brain. Mind you friends, the posterior cerebral artery also supplies the posterior part of the medial surface as well as the posterior part of the lateral surface. So there is no distinction in the posterior part of the brain. It is supplied by the posterior cerebral artery both medially and laterally. But on the lateral surface, it is maximum constituted by the middle cerebral artery whereas on the medial cerebral on the medial surface it is maximum supplied by the anterior cerebral artery so this is a quick image where you can assess the blood supply of the brain the it red area represents the origin of represents the supply of which artery yes it is the middle cerebral artery as it is the lateral surface of the brain the yellow area is shown it is the medial surface of the brain going by the corpus callosum and the cingulate gyrus, so it is supplied by the anterior cerebral artery. This can be a potential image based question, so, so I am emphasizing more on this topic. So, this is the motor homunculus, friends. You must have read about the motor homunculus in your physiology. This physiology comes on to us right through all the five years and even after medicine and even after all through our life. So you must be thorough with physiology all through your life. So this is the motor homunculus showing the lower limbs are supplied, the toes, the ankle, the knee are all present medially and are all represented medially. So medially represented is the lower limb and laterally represented is the upper limb and the face. So medially it is supplied by the anterior cerebral artery which is represented by the lower limb in the motor homunculus and laterally it is the middle cerebral artery which is represented in the motor homunculus. So the motor homunculus is very important question for your exams. You must be aware that the lower limb is represented medially and the upper limb and the face are represented laterally. This is a picture showing the difference between motor homunculus and the sensory homunculus. You must be aware that the lower limb are represented medially in the motor homunculus whereas the upper limb is represented laterally. But I am also emphasizing that the greater the precision of movement, for example, the thumb in the hand has a maximum representation in the motor homunculus. The muscles of mastication and the muscles of swallowing are all that are require more activity and more precision. So these are represented maximum in the motor homunculus. And again, the upper limb, all this area represented by the upper limb and the face is supplied by the middle cerebral artery and they are represented laterally. Whereas the area represented by the lower limb is supplied by the anterior cerebral artery. Again, the same holds true for the sensory homunculus. The genitals and the foot are represented medially, whereas the upper limb and the fingers and the lower limb and the tongue are all represented laterally. Again, the more the precession of sensation, the more the activity of sensation, the more the representation on the sensory homunculus. So sensory homunculus, the lips and the nose and the face carry the maximum representation Whereas the muscles of mastication and the eyelids and the jaw muscles maximum carry the maximum representation in the motor homunculus. So this was also a previous Ames question. The muscles of mastication carry a maximum representation or the largest representation in the motor homunculus. That was because they are they require more precision of movement and they require more activity. 
occlusion of the anterior cerebral artery would affect the sensory and the motor function of the contralateral leg and foot. As we already saw, the anterior cerebral artery infarct would cause the paralysis of the legs more commonly than the upper limb and the face, while predominantly sparing the contralateral arm and face because it is due to the cortical homunculus, that is, the area supplied by the middle cerebral artery. Patients with bilateral ACA occlusion. Again, friends, I emphasize that it is often read as ACA and MCA, anterior cerebral artery and middle cerebral artery. Often, full forms may not be given in exam as ACA and MCA, in fact, are some of the commonly used terms in clinic. So, you must be aware with them. So, I did not change the synonym for ACA and MCA right in all my slides so that to orient you that to the nomenclature of ACA infarct and MCA infarct. Patients with bilateral ACA occlusion can develop significant behavioral symptoms due to decreased blood supply to the frontal lobe and for example ebulia and urinary incontinence. Friends, what is ebulia? What is ebulia? Can any one of you say what is ebulia? Yes. It is the inability to learn or, or make new things. It is the inability to learn or seek new things. It is similar to amotivation and schizophrenia. So, in this way, we have heard a new word. So, we go back to psychiatry and read the important terms related to ebulia, echinacea, echolalia, all the terms which are discussed in general psychiatry. So, these are the terms. Echolalia and echopraxia. Praxia means movement friends, so echolalia is nothing but imitation of another person's movements. In this way, it represents imitation of the examiner's movements. Echolalia means imitation of the examiner's words. Echopraxia means imitation of the examiner's movements. And it is classically seen in catatonic schizophrenia. So echolalia and echopraxia are seen in catatonic schizophrenia. Ambitendency is series of uncertain, incomplete movements carried out when a voluntary action is anticipated. So, ambitendency is classically seen in OCDs. Ebulia is reduced impulses to think or act associated with indifferences about the consequences of the action. Chiefly, these are called, these are ebulia occurs due to decreased blood supply to the frontal lobe, which is classically caused by bilateral anterior cerebral artery occlusion. Echinacea. Echinacea is inability to move. Friends, in my previous video, I have emphasized that echinacea is classically included in the triad of a disease of a neurological disease. What is the disease? Yes, it is the Parkinson's disease. Rigidity, echinacea and resting tremor are included in the triad of Parkinson's disease. Mind you friends, the resting tremor is included in the triad but the pill rolling movements and mask like phases are not included in the triad. So, resting tremor, rigidity, and echinacea are seen in Parkinson's disease. Where are intention tremors seen? Yes, they are seen in cerebellar disease. Echinacea is the inability to sit or stand still. Echinacea classically occurs in a patient of schizophrenia moving restlessly in response to antipsychotics. Echinacea is the common side effect of antipsychotic drugs. And the drug of choice for echinacea is? Yes, it is propranolol. So, drug of choice or echinacea is propranolol. So, let's revise the terms we read in psychiatry. Echolalia, echopraxia, imitation of examiner's movements, examiner's sounds seen in catatonic schizophrenia. Ambitendency, not able to judge or do something seen in OCD. Ebulia, it is inability to think or carry on movements, classically resembles a motivation syndrome seen in, yes, bilateral ACA occlusion. And again, Echinacea, rigidity, and tremor are seen in Parkinson's disease. Echinacea in response to antipsychotic drugs. So, bilateral AC occlusion was also associated with urinary incontinence. What is the part of the brain responsible to maintain the urinary continence or prevent the urinary incontinence? Yes, it is the paracentral lobule. You may be required to identify the paracentral lobule in the brain. There may not be a direct question involving the paracentral lobule is responsible for urinary continence. There may be an indirect question. In bilateral AC occlusion, due to the involvement of a part of brain, the person is lost his urinary continence. What is the part of the brain involved? You should be able to identify the region of the brain involved. 
this is the paracentral lobule and this is classically involved in urinary continence. So if there is any bilateral ICI occlusion and there is reduced or absent blood supply to the paracentral lobule, then there will be urinary incontinence. Friends, don't get confused between the cingulate gyrus which is present medially and the cuneate gyrus which is present anteriorly. I used to get confused between them a lot. So I included this picture so that it will be clear for you. Cingulate gyrus is present medially and you can see that the paracentral lobule is present exactly above the cingulate gyrus. It derives its blood supply from the anterior cerebral artery and it is very important for the micturition center and it is the brain control of the micturition center and it is, when it is launched there will be urinary incontinence. Occlusion of the middle cerebral artery would affect the motor control of the hand. For example, hand gripping. This was asked in our question. Hand gripping, as it was upper limb sign, we excluded it out of anterior cerebral artery in part. Face hormone, example whistling, and throat, example swallowing. Out of proportion to the involvement of the leg, as we saw, the leg is chiefly supplied by the anterior cerebral artery. Once again, to emphasize, the area supplied by the middle cerebral artery represented by the upper limb and the face and the leg is paired in anti middle cerebral artery occlusion because it is supplied by the anterior cerebral artery. In rare cases, anterior cere middle cerebral artery occlusion can also result in Broca's aphasia and Wernicke's aphasia. Broca's aphasia due to the damage of the dominant frontal lobe. Friends, in all of us, the dominant frontal lobe is the left side lobe. In the Broca's area is the middle frontal gyrus. And anoscognosia and spatial neglect of the contralateral side due to the damage of the non-dominant parietal lobe. So, when there is damage of the Broca's dominant parietal lobe, there is dominant frontal lobe, there is Broca's aphasia. And spatial neglect is seen due to the damage of the non-dominant parietal lobe. Conjugate case deviation towards the side of the stroke. And contralateral homonymous hemianopia can also be seen due to the damage to the optic radiations in the subcortical region. So all these are rare, but the classical thing you need to remember is Broca's aphasia and Wernicke's aphasia can be seen in MCA in fact only if the dominant lobe is affected. So this is the CT of a young male coming to the casualty with weakness of the right upper limb and lower limb. Can you identify the sign shown in the CT? This is a spot arc, my dear friends. You must get it right. What is it? Yes, it is the dense MCA sign seen in middle cerebral artery in fact. So you cannot get it right. Wrong. Dense MCA sign seen in middle cerebral artery in fact is a classical spotter in radiology and you cannot get it wrong. So this is how we correlate anatomy with radiology and medicine. Question number two. Which of the following is not a feature of Right middle cerebral artery in part. Option A, aphasia. Option C, dysarthria. Option B, dysarthria. Option C, hemiparesis. Option D, facial weakness. Yes, what is the answer? Yes, it is aphasia, which is not a feature of right middle cerebral artery in part. Why? Because the dominant lobe, like I said, in all of us is the left lobe. All of us, most of us are right-handed and the dominant lobe is the left hemisphere. But mind you friend, in the left-handed individuals also, the dominant lobe is the left hemisphere. So in most of us, the dominant lobe is the left hemisphere. And it is only in the dominant lobe, the Broca's area and the Wernicke's area are present. So they are absent in the non-dominant lobe, that is in the right lobe of the brain. So in the right MCA, in fact, aphasia is not seen due to the sparing of the Wernicke's and the Broca's area which are present in the dominant lobe of the brain. Aphasia so is a feature of dominant hemisphere affection where it is the right side which is involved which is the non-dominant hemisphere in most of the individuals. Dysarthria as many of you would have doubted can occur due to the affection of either hemisphere. So dysarthria can be seen both in upper motor neuron lesion and lower motor neuron lesion. Dysarthria can be seen in both dominant hemisphere and non-dominant hemisphere. In general, dysarthria can be upper motor neuron lesion type of type or lower motor neuron lesion type. Upper motor neuron lesion type of dysarthria 
occurs due to the corticospinal tract affection, particularly affection of the neurons innervating the tongue and the rest of the speech apparatus. So dysarthria can be seen in any lobe, whereas the MCA infarct affecting the dominant lobe will only produce aphasia. This was the previous AIMS question, so I included this here. Question number 4. A 74-year-old male wakes up at 8 a.m. and finds he is unable to move his upper limb and the left lower limb. By 9 a.m., he is taken into the nearest hospital and MRI brain done showing right middle cerebral artery infarct. What is the next best step in the management of the patient? Friends, history taking must be at your fingertips in your wards. This is the skill you must have exercised all through your four years. In this case, you see that a 74-year-old male wakes up at 8 a.m. and finds that he is unable to move his left upper limb and left lower limb. Now, what do you infer, my dear friends? The onset of stroke is at 8 a.m. or before 8 a.m. Yes, you must consider the onset of stroke to be at sleep because he finds he is unable to move his upper limb and lower limb while he already was on bed. So, the onset of stroke or the CVA was during sleep. So, at 8 a.m., you do not consider the onset of stroke to be at 8 a.m. This is where history taking is very, very important in medicine. So, you must be able to identify the onset of stroke because the thrombolysis, the chief treatment in any case of CVA, which will be life-saving for any patient, will be given only and only if the patient is brought within four and a half hours of the onset of stroke, which is quite rare in our setup. So, when he wakes up at 8 a.m. and finds he is unable to move, you would have considered that the stroke was occurred at night and you would have considered at that it is more than four and a half hours. So thrombolysis is a big no in this condition. So that was the trick which was used in this question. The onset of stroke was during sleep that is more than four and a half hours. The cutoff for RTPA. What does RTPA stand for? Recombinant tissue plasminogen activator. And thrombolysis cannot be given as the window period has already extended and so the onset of stroke is mandatory taken during sleep. These are the famous cutoffs for thrombolysis. Friends, there are only three conditions in the entire medicine where thrombolysis is given. The first one is MI, which is very, very important and very crucial as well. MI thrombolysis is given as early as 30 minutes and can, cannot be given after 12 hours. So, in case of MI, again, this is a potential question. If the hospital is well established and there is facility for angiogram or percutaneous coronary intervention popularly known as PCA. PCA responsible hospitals can directly go for angiogram and stunting and thrombolysis is not required in PCA capable hospitals. So in case of MI, thrombolysis can be done from 30 minutes to 12 hours. In case of CVA or stroke, as discussed in our case, the thrombolysis can be done from 3 hours to 4 and a half hours. In case of pulmonary thromboembolism, this is another case of thrombolysis and the only indication of thrombolysis in pulmonary thromboembolism is massive pulmonary thromboembolism. There are basically three types of pulmonary thromboembolism, mild, submassive and massive. And massive pulmonary thromboembolism is the only indication of thrombolysis and it can be given from hours to weeks, ideally within 12 hours. So these are the only three indications of cutoff time for thrombolysis in the entire medicine. Again, in my topic of snake bite, we discussed this is known as door to needle time or the window period, door to needle time. But in my topic of snake bite, we discussed about the importance of bead to needle time, bite to needle time. The bite to needle time should be ideally within 30 minutes and must be given within 6 to 12 hours. This was also discussed in my, in my discussion of snake bite. Mind you friends, there is no signs of raised ICT or cerebellar edema in this patient. So, hemorrhagic stroke is ruled out and NCCT is usually not done in the patient. Let's see this twist in the question. We see that by 9 am, he is taken to the nearest hospital and MRI brain was done. Usually, when a patient of stroke comes to you, you will do NCCT to rule out hemorrhage. But in this case, MRI brain was done showing right middle cerebral artery infarct. So, usually MRI is the investigation of choice to detect any infarct, but MRI takes time 
and the patient has to hemodynamically stable to perform an MRI. So usually it is the NCCT which is done in the casualty setup to rule out hemorrhage. But in this case, as the onset of stroke is more than four and a half hours and MRI was done and there are no signs of rise dicity. What is the first sign of rise dicity which, can, which you can see in casualty? Yes, projectile vomiting, headache and everything can be seen but which you can view as a physician can see as a sign is the papillary edema with the ophthalmoscope or the direct ophthalmoscope or the fundoscope. So papillary edema has to be ruled out and there are no signs of rise dicity mentioned in the patient. So hemorrhage is ruled out and you do not go back and perform an NCCT in this patient. So this is also a twist in this question. NCCT was not done, MRI was already showing an infarct. So you need not think of hemorrhage any, anywhere. All, and already in the question, there are no signs of rise dicity or cerebral edema given. So identifying by the keyword, you will see that the patient is unable to move his left upper limb and left lower limb. So there is right left hemiplegia with right MCA infarct and MRI brain showed the infarct. So RTPA is ruled out as the, as the window period has already started. And NCCT brain is already ruled out as there are no signs of rise DICT and heparin and aspirin. Among these two, you'll first start the patient on aspirin and then you think of heparin, but heparin is usually avoided as there are increased chances of bleeding in this patient. So aspirin is the next step you do in this patient. Many of you would have marked it as RTPA, but no, the window period has already started because the patient woke up as paralyzed as woke up and then he's unable to move out of his bed. So it is taken that the onset of stroke is during sleep. So aspirin is the next best step in the management of this patient. Question number five. A 55 year old woman is brought to the hospital due to several days of progressive dyspnea, productive cough and fever. Today, her son found her to be severely dyspneic and obtended. The patient has history of hypertension, type 2 diabetes mellitus and long-standing severe rheumatoid arthritis. Emergency department evaluation reveals bilateral pneumonia and severe respiratory distress. She is lethargic without focal neurological deficit. Urgent endotracheal intubation is performed for mechanical ventilation and the patient was started on broad spectrum antipaid. Again friends, a long question. You need to identify the keywords. Keywords is the thing which differentiate you from completing the paper and those who fail to complete the paper. This recent need was a 300 long, hour long, 3 hour long, 300 question grueling OPD session. So you cannot get, you cannot just simply sit and read all the question. You need to identify the keywords right from the first go. And this you'll come, you'll get to know only by MCQ practice. So I'll again emphasize you to practice more MCQs and practice more long questions so that you can identify the keywords easily and you can rightly reach the answer just by reading the entire question. So 55 year old woman, progressive dyspnea, protective cough and fever. The patient has many comorbidities. She is, hyper, she is hypertensive, type 2 diabetes mellitus and long standing severe rheumatoid arthritis. Emergency department evaluation reveals bilateral pneumonia and severe respiratory distress. We know that rheumatoid arthritis predisposes to the development of pneumonia and other interstitial lung diseases. Again, the pneumonia, there can be pleural effusion in a case of pneumonia, which can be synpneumonic effusion or paranemonic effusion. Classically, the, pleural, the fluid of pleural effusion in a, case, in a patient of rheumatoid arthritis classically has what? Yes. The glucose is exceptionally low in the pleural fluid of a patient with rheumatoid arthritis suffering with pleural effusion. This is a classical question. This is like she is lethargic without focal neurological deficit. Urgent endotracheal intubation is performed for mechanical ventilation and the patient is started on broad spectrum antibiotics. Repeat examination after several hours has shown that she has developed areflexic paralysis of all the four extremities. Which of the following is the most likely cause for the neurological deficit of this patient? Option A, cerebral septic emboli. Option B, diabetic neuropathy. Option C, bullion barry syndrome. Option D, malignant hypothermia. Option E, vertebral subluxation. Again, do you have any idea what is the answer? 
long standing case of diabetes hypertension and uh, rheumatoid arthritis came with pneumonia urgent and shortness of breath urgent endotracheal intubation was done and mechanical ventilation was started few hours later she developed a reflexic paralysis of all the four extremities what do you suspect any guesses yes it is the vertebral subluxation which is leading to a reflexic paralysis in this patient long standing case of rheumatoid arthritis is the key in this question long standing case of rheumatoid arthritis predisposes to atlanto axial or cervical instability so you must perform a endotracheal intubation with minute care in such patient in this patient you performed an urgent endotracheal intubation which leaded to vertebral subluxation and decompression of the spinal cord when the patient landed up in aeroflexic paralysis resulting in spinal shock so this is the manifestation of vertebral subluxation leading to compression of the spinal cord leading to spinal shock and aeroflexic paralysis of the all the extremities and also the bladder and bowel are also affected this is the classical description in this case so let's see this case in detail severe chronic rheumatoid arthritis can involve the cervical spine and cause destruction with vertebral subluxation so you must be careful as a doctor you must be aware that a long standing case of rheumatoid arthritis will have cervical spine instability so you must take care while intubating the patient otherwise you could land up the patient in trouble so this is a must know with all the doctors of the country severe rheumatoid arthritis has cervical spine instability again one more syndrome a child with webbing of the neck and with coarctation of the aorta classically can also show cervical spine instability what is the syndrome which can show cervical spine instability yes what is the syndrome associated with cervical spine instability yes it is the down syndrome down syndrome baby with webbing of the neck and most commonly presenting with cubitus valgus and most commonly the heart defect involved is coarctation of aorta such children or such babies can have cervical spine instability so as a doctor you must be aware of this fact and you must perform endotracheal intubation or other procedures with minute care again one more syndrome which is associated with cervical spine instability it is none other than yes it is the male counterpart of the down syndrome yes it is the noonan syndrome which is also associated with cervical spine instability so you must be aware with all these three cases so that you can intubate with care and you can look for uh, atlanto axial subluxation and sudden decompression of the spinal cord so let's see about the atlanto axial joint atlanto axial joint is more commonly involved and more prone to subluxation as the atlas has a high degree of motility relative to the axis that is the c2 odontoid process in the body so atlas is the first vertebra and axis is below it where axis has an odontoid process and it fits in with the atlas so that atlas can freely move with lim- the axis has limited intrinsic mobility what is the type of joint atlanto axial joint is which type of joint friends yes it is the pivot type of joint so atlanto axial joint is a pivot type of joint and you must be aware of all the type of joints in our body so that it becomes easier for you to memorize so when our i say atlanto axial joint is a pivot type of joint you must take your anatomy book and see the types of joint this is also an important memory based question you must write all these memory based questions in a separate 20th notebook which i emphasize all through my lectures so what is the sternoclavicular joint type of yes it is a saddle type of joint so you must be aware of all these type of joint and they must be at your fingertips the atlanto axial joint is a pivot type of joint with greater mobility of the atlas with the odontoid process of axis fitting snugly into the atlas and the atlas has a wide range of mobility again need 2019 question the yes movement or the flexion of the neck yes movement occurs at the atlanto axial joint or atlanto occipital joint yes yes movement occurs at the atlanto axial joint whereas no movement occurs at the atlanto axial joint yes comes before no so you first say to yes you learn to say yes and then you learn to say no so yes movement or nodding the head up and down is a movement at the atlanto occipital joint whereas no movement is the movement which occurs at the atlanto axial joint so side to side movement of the neck is brought about at the atlanto axial joint this was the exact question 
so no movement at the atlanta axial joint atlanta occipital joint the yes movement laxity or destruction of the transverse ligaments or the progressive erosion or fracture of the odontoid process increase the anterior movement of the atlas causing spinal decompression due to the posterior displacement of the odontoid process so let's see the in the pictorial representation classically this is the x-ray showing atlanto axial subluxation in a patient of rheumatoid arthritis and where you can see the gap between the vertebrae has increased and classically it is a sign of atlanto axial subluxation again you must be again emphasizing cervical spine instability is also seen in down syndrome and its male counterpart noonan syndrome as well you can see this is the atlas or the c1 this is the axis or the c2 the odontoid process of the axis fits subtly into the atlas and it is bounded by the transverse ligament and the longitudinal arches of the atlas so the atlas is freely mobile but the axis is not freely mobile so whenever there is vertebral decompression or violent or rigorous endotracheal intubation there may be a chance of the subluxation of the atlas the atlas which comes forward and the odontoid process of axis which goes back and compresses the spinal cord resulting in aeriflexic paralysis of all the extremities so this is the axis in which the atlanto axial joint works this is the odontoid process of the axis and this is the atlas which is freely mobile over the axis and this is the transverse ligament which is cut during the trans during the subluxation of the atlanto axial joint again emphasize this is a pivot type of joint you must remember all the examples of the joints and it is a must question in any exam so symptoms of atlanto axial subluxation include neck pain or stiffness or stiffness or neurological instability which features suggestive of radicular pain so the c2 nerve root is the first nerve root to be compressed and it results in radicular pain and then it results in spinal cord compression and spinal shock features endotracheal intubation with extension of the neck this is the culprit in this patient which brought about the atlanto axial subluxation it can worsen the subluxation with progressive acute compression of the spinal cord patients can develop paralysis with decreased or absent reflexes below the level of spinal compression which is known as spinal shock again my dear friend you might be aware that the c2 and c1 are upper motor neuron lesion to both upper limb and lower limb but they are presenting with a reflexia so spinal cord there is usually hyperreflexia and hypotonia but they are presenting with a reflexia because they are in a state of spinal shock this is the trick in this question in a state of spinal shock there is hyper there is a reflexia and you must be aware of this fact so there is hypo a reflexia or hyperreflexia again what is the first reflex to repeat, to reappear when a patient recovers from spinal shock yes it is the bulbo cavernous reflex which is the first reflex to reappear when a patient recovers from spinal shock hypotension is also seen due to the loss of sympathetic tone again you must be aware of the sympathetic ganglia that lie adjacent to the cervical vertebra and this can lead to sudden cardiac death so as a doctor you must be aware that there, there is cervical spine instability in a patient of severe tonic rheumatoid arthritis and also down syndrome so let's see what are the other causes of a reflexic paralysis ascending symmetric a reflexic paralysis is seen in yes it is seen in most commonly following diarrhea by campylobacter jejuni ascending symmetric aeriflexic paralysis yes it is seen in gullian barre syndrome most commonly following diarrhea caused by campylobacter jejuni this is due to the cross imm immunity or cross reactivity between the viral pathogens and the self pathogen and the antibodies tend to damage our own self tissues resulting in gullian barre syndrome This is a very important question, friend, and you must know that the bladder is involved late in Gurian Barre syndrome. Descending aeriflexic flaccid paralysis is seen in. Yes, friends, I have discussed about the descending type of paralysis in my previous video as well. They are classically seen in snake bite and botulinum toxicity. What type of snakes causes flaccid paralysis or descending paralysis? they are only the neurotoxic type of snakes which cause the descending paralysis they include the common cobra the king cobra and also the crate 
these are the two snakes which cause the descending flaccid type of paralysis again you must be aware that the king the crate has a mechanism of action which is similar to that of a botulinum toxin botulinum toxin and crate both affect the presynaptic release of the acetylcholine and thereby they cause flaccid paralysis whereas the cobra bite causes the postsynaptic release of the of the acetylcholine and it also causes a flaccid type of paralysis again this is a potential question because neostigmin has a role only in cobra bite and neostigmin has no role in crate bite so neostigmin has a role only in cobra bite and no role in crate bite because crate bite inhibits the presynaptic release of acetylcholine and neostigmin has no role in its toxicity i have discussed them in detail in my previous video of snake bite you can view it later again descending hyperreflexic spastic paralysis descending hyperreflexic spastic paralysis is seen with yes descending hyperreflexic and spastic paralysis is classically seen with strychnine poisoning and tetanus poisoning so these are the important questions of your toxicology descending hyperreflexic spastic paralysis are seen with strychnine poisoning and tetanus poisoning you must be aware that the mechanism of action of both of them is similar but they, it is different in different sense because we'll see that in the form of a picture so both strychnine and tetanus toxin blocks the release of glycine which is an inhibitory neurotransmitter so cause inhibition of inhibitory neurotransmitter so they stimulate the spinal cord resulting in hyperreflexic and hypotonic type of paralysis so they inhibit the release of glycine which stimulates the alpha motor neuron and it results in hyperreflexic type of paralysis but strychnine blocks the receptors of the glycine whereas tetanus toxin blocks the release of the glycine so they are similar in a way but they are different in the mechanism of action they are similar in the sense that they inhibit the action of glycine they cause inhibition of inhibition so they stimulate the spinal cord resulting in hyperreflexic type of paralysis the only cell in the spinal cord releasing uh, uh, inhibitory neurotransmitter glycine is the renshaw cell this is the retrograde inhibition or the feed forward inhibition in the spinal cord which you must have studied in your physiology so this renshaw cell inhibition by glycine is inhibited by strychnine and tetanus toxin so that it causes an excitation type of paralysis and hyperreflexia again inhibition of release of acetylcholine by the snare protein is caused by botulinum toxin and it causes classic type of paralysis so strychnine is also known by the name of nux vomica and it is a fatal poison and as as much as one seed is also a poison in case of strychnine poisoning both in strychnine poisoning and tetanus poisoning the opisthotonus posturing may be seen but classically the rhesus sardonius is seen in tetanus poisoning coming to the other options Cerebral septic emboli are usually due to infective endocarditis of the left-sided heart valve. Patient can develop neurological findings with paralysis, but do not acutely have do not usually have acute onset quadri paralysis. Like I said, acute onset quadri paralysis is rare in a case of cerebral septic emboli because there is already a pre-existing case of infective endocarditis, and the signs and symptoms of infective endocarditis, especially fever. may be seen in a case of infective endocarditis like we already read the vegetations in infective endocarditis are large and friable and they are easily to emboli they are easy to embolize to the brain so cerebral septic emboli can also be a cause but it does not present so acutely diabetic neuropathy is the most common cause of neuropathy all over the world it presents with a slowly progressive disease which results in the loss of vibration so the vibration sense is the first sense to be affected in diabetic neuropathy this is also a potential question with proprioception and temperature temperature sensations affected later how do you test for vibration sense in diabetic neuropathy yes you use a 128 hertz tuning fork in a patient of diabetic neuropathy mind you friend the 256 and the 512 hertz are used in your ent department they are used to test for hearing whereas the 128 hertz tuning fork is used to test your vibration sense again to remember the lower limbs are affected more commonly than the upper limb so you usually test the lower limbs in a case of diabetic neuropathy early neuropathy can cause decreased ankle reflexes 
whereas later disease can cause widespread loss of reflexes with motor weakness. So bilateral loss of ankle reflex can be seen in diabetic neuropathy in late cases. Again to memorize and to revise my dear friends, bilateral Babinski positive has been discussed in my previous video where what is the condition which can produce bilateral Babinski positive. Yes, it is a case of pontine hemorrhage. So classically, it is a case of boolean barry syndrome presents with progressively increasing weakness and the weakness is never sudden in onset, symmetric muscle weakness with absent or decreased reflexes that is areflexia. These the abnormalities typically start in the lower extremities and then ascending paralysis, ascend upwards. So ascending areflexic symmetric paralysis is boolean barry syndrome usually 1 to 2 weeks or 2 to 4 months after Campylobacter jejuni infection and most commonly the bladder is affected late in Guillain barre syndrome whereas in vertebral subluxation we also saw the bladder and bowel symptoms to be involved. So the bladder involvement is late in a case of Guillain barre syndrome. Again the last and the important topic is malignant hypothermia. Malignant hypothermia is usually due to anesthesia exposure especially halothene and succinylcholine causing increased and sustained muscle contraction with increased myocyte breakdown. Patients typically develop muscle rigidity followed by hypothermia and possible myoglobinuria. So this is a very important topic friend. You must know the triggers of malignant hypothermia. You must know the drug of choice of malignant hypothermia because this is an emergency in case of anesthesia setting and you must handle this case. Most commonly it is due to halothane or succinylcholine or as such can occur with any inhalational anesthetic. The first and the most important sign of malignant hypothermia is mesetospasm. Mesetospasm is usually the first sign of malignant hypothermia but it is usually manifesting late. Usually the first thing we see in our OT is raised ETCO2. So raised ETCO2 is the first sign you see in case of malignant hypothermia whereas mesetospasm is the first symptom you see in case of malignant hypothermia. So let's see in detail about the drug of choice of malignant hypothermia. So what is the drug of choice of malignant hypothermia? You must be aware of this. Yes, my dear friends, it's dantrolene sodium, which is the drug of choice for malignant hypothermia. This is a pharma question and it is a must, must no question and you must be thorough with this topic. So it is basically dantrolene sodium, which is blocking the rhinodine receptor blockers. So that in malignant hypothermia, there's extensive release of calcium from the rhinodine sensing where the rhinodine sensing calcium receptors are defective and extensively calcium is released by the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So it is that rhinodine receptor blocker, dantrolene sodium, it is a life-saving drug in case of malignant hypothermia. So like already said, the pathology lies with the, the rhinodine receptor in case of malignant hypothermia. Patients with rhinodine receptor mutation are susceptible for the development of malignant hypothermia. So there is more reflex of calcium from the sarcoplastic reticulum leading to sustained muscle contraction and increased energy consumption. And anaerobic metabolism is chiefly followed like you already know from biochemistry. Anaerobic metabolism, the chief product which is produced is the lactate. So there is increased production of lactate and there is invariably lactic acidosis. And again, there is production of hypothermia or heat. Again, this is a potential question. Hypothermia in malignant hypothermia usually manifest late. So do not go by the name and get confused and say temperature rise is the first manifestation of malignant hypothermia. But no, hypothermia is usually a rare condition, sorry, is a late condition of malignant hypothermia. And again, increased carbon dioxide is produced leading to cell damage. So basically, this rhinodine receptor is blocked by dantrolene sodium and so dantrolene sodium is the drug of choice for this malignant hypothermia. Let's see what are the triggers for malignant hypothermia. We already saw in our question that the triggers for malignant hypothermia are all the inhalational anesthetics, especially halothane and succinylcholine. And again, the succinylcholine is a muscle relaxant which can precipitate malignant hypothermia. All the volatile inhalational anesthetics can be can precipitate malignant hypothermia, especially seoflurane, desflurane, and halothane. All these are triggering agents for malignant hypothermia. Again friend, you must know the non-triggering agents or the safe agents responsible or which are safe with malignant hypothermia. These are none other than the propofol and ketamine. Ketamine is in fact used in treating malignant hypothermia. Propofol is the drug anesthetic 
which is used in daycare surgery for minor surgical procedures. And mind you friends, there was a previous AIMS question on propofol. Propofol is the drug which is contraindicated in egg allergy patients. And uh, ketamine, the side effects of ketamine, you must be aware. And ketamine also produces dissociative anesthesia. So propofol, ketamine and nitrous oxide are all safe and non-triggering agents which cannot precipitate malignant hyperthermia. non depolarizing muscle relaxants are also non-triggering agents for malignant hyperthermia. Let's see the management part of malignant hyperthermia. We saw that dantrolene sodium is the drug of choice for malignant hypothermia. But friends, don't get fooled by the question. You must always follow the ABCD protocol while managing any emergency. You just don't start with dantrolene sodium. First, you start with airway. And first, you stop the agents which precipitate malignant hypothermia. That is, sevoflurane, desflurane, and halothane. And then, you administer non-triggering agents, preferably ketamine or propofol. And then, you ask for help and ask for malig malignant hypothermia protocol chart. So you inform the surgeon and the staff that the patient is going into malignant hypothermia right away. And so you stop all the triggering agents and you administer non-triggering agents. Then you go for breathing or B, you immediately hyperventilate the patient with 100% oxygen as it is life-saving and the patient can die on the table if you do not initiate the breathing. Cooling procedures if the patient's temperature is more than 102.2 degrees Fahrenheit. Like already said, hypothermia is usually a rare, is a rare and a late complication of malignant hypothermia. And D, finally, dandrolene sodium is the drug of choice. Continuous rapid IV push is the recommended for the treatment of malignant hypothermia. But again, first thing you need to manage is the airway and the agent, and then only you go for dandrolene sodium. Don't just answer the drug of choice as the first step. So firstly, if, you, if there was a clinical question on malignant hypothermia, they'll ask the first step you do. First step, you should stop the triggering agent and administer a non-triggering agent. If they ask what is the drug of choice, then you'll answer it is dantrolene sodium, which is done in a continuous IV rapid push. So this way, you need to manage malignant hypothermia. So that's all for today, my dear friend. I hope it helped you integrate your knowledge of medicine with ophthalmology pharmacology and physiology. This is how we read medicine. This is how you read clinical long questions. Tomorrow, I'll come up with one more clinical video and one more emphasizing the importance of integration. So that's all for today, my dear friend. Stay tuned for further updates. Thank you very much.